This video is sponsored by BetterHelp. Farina, I've just met an archon named Farina. Wait, that's not, that's a musical by Leonard Bernstein, uh, West Side Story. It's not surprising to me in the least that the charismatic diva that is the Hydro Archon, Farina the Fontaine, would have constellations relating to opera. After all, the opera Epicles played a significant role in the story of Fontaine. And while we didn't see any opera as we know it today, a form of theater where a story is conveyed not through the use of spoken dialogue, well, sometimes in zingspiels, but never mind that for right now. Like a play, but rather a story told through singing. Opera is the truest definition of musical theater, combining singing, acting, symphonic writing, ballet, and chorus performances. Music is everything we're talking about opera because, well, music is essential to characters moving the plot forward and cluing the audience into emotions they should connect with and feel. <sighs> opera mixes music and drama together to move and impact. So it makes sense that Farina would have some sort of involvement with opera, since she has seen countless shows and experienced many different kinds of performances performances, including her own. Opera is actually incredibly important to the characterization of Farina as a larger-than-life diva, if you will. Let me, a trained professional opera singer with over a decade of experience and has performed with the Philadelphia Orchestra, the New York Philharmonic, Glimmerglass Opera, Opera Santa Barbara, Arizona Opera, be your operatic guide through opera. And what makes the names of these constellations so cool for both opera lovers, musicians, and newcomers alike. Carmen. Carmen is an opera in four acts written and composed by Georges Bizet, being G-E-O-R-G-E-S. Why is the S there? Only the French know. One of his most famous works, actually, despite having produced over 10 operas in his time as a composer, sadly, his other works, besides Pecheur de Perle, don't get a lot of recognition. I suppose it doesn't really matter, considering that Carmen is regularly used as an example of what opera is. It is described as one of the greatest operas ever written. Sure, Bizet might end up actually being a one-hit wonder, but I am not sure that he'd be complaining all that much if he were alive today. Bizet was born on October 25th, 1938 in Paris, France, and went on to enter the Paris Conservatoire at the age of nine, even becoming a student of other famous French composer Charles Gounod. Bizet struggled to get the recognition he felt he deserved despite all of his hard work, and it wasn't until Carmen that he felt he had finally achieved the success that he felt he merited. Carmen was actually inspired by a novella, not a novel. Did you know there's a difference? Apparently, a novel is a work of prose fiction with a word count of 40,000 words or more, while a novella is a work of prose fiction with a word count between 17,500 and 40,000 words. So, a baby novel. Written by Prosper Mary May titled Carmen, that was published in 1845, when Bizet was six or seven years old. This story was set in Seville in the Andalusian region of Spain, depicting a strong and independent character, a passionate tale of the strong and spirited gypsy woman, Carmen, which captivated and entranced Bizet to the point that he felt he must tell tell this story through music. Carmen is actually a pretty wild story if you really get down to the nitty gritty of it. Carmen, the wild and free gypsy, refuses to be tamed, men throwing themselves at her feet, women fearing her. She captivated and entranced anyone who came near her. Flighty, fickle, and tempestuous, she lived to be free and to experience the pleasures of love and lust. That is until, of course, she meets the good soldier, Don Jose, who would never be turned by such nonsense. That is, until he is falling madly in lust with Carmen, fleeing the military to be with her, desiring her, even going to jail for her, only for her to get bored with his desire to follow the rules, becoming a weight for her freedom. She becomes frustrated and annoyed by his controlling jealousy, and in a fit of jealous and murderous rage at seeing her with another lover, he begs her to come back to him, only to be rejected, and ultimately stabbing her in front of the Torridor Arena in one of opera's most incredible and stunning scenes of musical excitement and intensity. The opera ends with Carmen in Don Jose's arms, surrounded by soldiers exclaiming, Ah, Carmen, my beloved Carmen, death to you and death to me. Ah, ma Carmen, ah, my cherished Carmen, I kill you. I belong to you. Unbelievably powerful stuff in that writing, especially in Act 4 of Carmen, Bizet was fascinated with Spanish culture, the captivating characters, the Spanish music elements, and the habanera rhythm. This produces that famous aria we know and can now connect randomly to Genshin Impact, La Mood et un Oiseau Rebelle. Love is a rebellious bird that no one can tame, and it is useless to call if it suits him to refuse. Love is a gypsy child. He has never ever known a law. If you don't love me, I love you. And if I love you, 
beware of yourself. Thus explaining all of Carmen, the character, in a single three minute piece of music. Sadly, Bizet never got to see public reception for his ultimately famous work, as he died just three months after the opera's mixed reception premiere. He would never know that his opera would eventually become synonymous with the greatest opera of all time. Yet here we are, 148 years later, the words from his opera in a game that features a character much like Carmen in some ways in her own right, still reflecting on that young genius composer from so long ago. You know, we're talking a lot about the Hydro Archon in this video, but you know what we haven't mentioned yet? Therapy. After 500 years of living with a mask on, protecting herself and keeping secrets, good old Farina could really truly benefit from some therapy, huh? I know I did when I was in my opera singing days, before and after I decided to retire from the professional stage. Not to mention how vital grief counseling was for me after losing my dad. I couldn't have managed without therapy and grief counseling. So when BetterHelp reached out to sponsor this video, I jumped at the opportunity. I'm a huge proponent of mental well-being and taking care of yourself. For a long time, I worked with student trainees, which can definitely be helpful, but it's definitely a bit awkward when it's not the right fit or they're a bit too rigid trying to be perfect and by the book. BetterHelp is awesome because they connect you with a licensed therapist with years of experience to help you navigate problem areas or just listen, so you can navigate life just a little bit easier. The best part is whether it's a phone call, video chat, or literally messaging, there are tons of ways to connect with one of 30,000 therapists in their network. Maybe just don't play Genshin when you're on the call. It's really easy to start too. All you have to do is fill out a questionnaire and in most cases, you'll be matched with a therapist within 48 hours. It goes without saying, but you can always switch therapists too if it just doesn't feel like a good fit. If you think you could use therapy and don't know how or where to start, feel free to check out the link in the description. They're also graciously giving 10% off your first month when you use my link, www.betterhelp.com slash MarcoMeatball. See if BetterHelp is right for you. Rigoletto. The next constellation we see features text, and honestly this stumped me because I had no idea what the f**k a duckweed is. A woman adapts like duckweed in water from the absolutely and positively fantastic aria La Donne Mobile, the banger hit from Verdi's Rigoletto. An aria, by the way, is another word for song. Use it. It's fancy and cool. That Verdi knew would be catchy. So catchy, in fact, that he hit it right up until the premiere. Or so legend says. And in fact, people were humming this tune up and down the street after the premiere. And honestly, who can blame them? Yep, that's actually me singing it in a performance from 2016. There is so much that can be said about Giuseppe Verdi when it comes to his impact on Italian musical history, and hesitantly, even its political history. Verdi is known to be one of Italy's greatest composers, his chorus, Va Pensiero, from Nabucco, becoming the unofficial national anthem in the hearts of many Italians, believing it to be a symbol for Italian identity and unity. It gives Italians a sense of pride and patriotism that has continued to remain in Italian hearts to this day. Prior to the writing of Rigoletto in 1851, though, Verdi had suffered a series of devastating losses. In 1838, due to the loss of his wife and children passing away in a relatively short time span, he found his music struggling to connect with audiences, his operas receiving lukewarm receptions or failing outright. It is said that in the galley years, as they were called, he locked himself in an apartment and began churning out operas. And churn out he did composing five operas in the span of five years. Alberto, Conte di San Bonifacio, Un Giorno di Regno, Nabucco, I Lombardi alla Prima Crociata, and Ernani between 1839 and 1844. Nabucco being the opera that, like I mentioned earlier, featured Va Pensiero, a piece so moving that apparently it is said that during a performance, several people unfurled an Italian flag and waved it as an act of patriotism and solidarity. People would shout Viva Verdi in the streets, which stood for two things, Giuseppe Verdi's music being the music of the unification of Italy, whether or not he wanted it to be, and Viva Vittorio Emanuele, Re d'Italia. Hooray for Victor Emmanuel, King of Italy, a prominent and key figure in the movement for Italian unification. So as you can imagine, Verdi was a bit of a celebrity by the time Rigoletto came out in 1851. It's captivating storyline, emotional and catchy music, compelling characters, and the popularity of Verdi himself led this to be an instant success at its premiere. Rigoletto is an opera in three acts, composed by Giuseppe Verdi, uh, duh, with a libretto by Francesco Maria Piave. It premiered in Venice in 1851 and is actually based off of Victor Hugo's of Les Rob fame, Le Roi's Amuse, or The King Amuses Himself. The story revolves around Rigoletto, a hunchbacked court jester trying to make his living in the court of the philanderous and skeezy Duke of Mantua, a tenor, of course. Rigoletto is forced to be cruel and miserable and entertain the Duke and his constituents until he's cursed by Count Monterone, after Monterone's daughter has been seduced and dishonored by the Duke. The curse claims that whoever is cursed shall suffer the same fate 
sorrow and loss of a loved one. What no one in the court knows, however, is that Rigoletto is actually protecting and hiding his daughter away, Childa, whom he never allows to leave their home and courtyard. He fears being followed home by members of the court and having Gilda be discovered. God forbid she become another one of the Duke's victims. Rigoletto, of course, doesn't realize that you cannot keep a bird caged, and Gilda has in fact been secretly visited several times by a young man, Gualtier Malde, who actually ends up being the Duke himself. She falls madly in love with him and his name, singing the famous aria Caronome. The courtiers eventually follow Rigoletto home, kidnap Gilda, whom they believe to be Rigoletto's lover, and bring her to the Duke. In his desperation, Rigoletto goes to the court only to discover that Gilda has lost her purity to the Duke and vows revenge. Rigoletto hires Spadafucile, an assassin, to kill the Duke in Gilda's honor, but in the end, Gilda sacrifices herself in the name of love for the Duke. At the very end, we hear La donna mobile qual più mal vento, as Rigoletto sits in front of a bag that was supposed to contain the Duke's body, only to discover that it is that of his daughter, Gilda. They sing one final duet of love between father and daughter before she passes in Rigoletto's arms. The curse was real and did in fact come true. This opera's themes focus on love, betrayal, vengeance, and the consequences of living two lives and deception. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We also see Farina in the lyrics, woman is fickle, like a feather in the wind. She changes her voice and her mind, and in tears or in jest, she is always lying. Turandot. If I played you one aria, and I said you'll recognize it immediately, it will either be the Toreador from Carmen, or it would be this one, Nessun Dorma. Indeed, Nessun Dorma was always an exceptional hit written by Giacomo Puccini, and was a hit from the get-go, but I personally think that what really thrusts it into the mainstream was a performance on the eve of the 1990 FIFA World Cup Final by the Three Tenors, Placido Domingo, Luciano Pavarotti, and Jose Carreras. Adding to the meaning of course was that Carreras had been diagnosed with leukemia three years prior, this being his first return to the stage after battling the disease, a symbol of hope, resilience, and inspiration. Much like Nessun Dorma itself, this song thrusts us to the upper stratosphere at the tenor vocal range, high-flying feats of stress and worry, and if that tenor makes it, boy does it hit home. <laughs> Puccini was a master of melody, and Nessun Dorma was melody forward in more ways than usual. Something about this piece just took it out of the opera and into the homes of people everywhere. One of few opera arias to truly escape the greater context of where it belongs. Puccini really was the successor of Italian opera in Italy after Verdi, despite other Italian contemporaries like Mascagni and Leon Cavallo being around and building careers at the very same time. In fact, you've likely heard of something called Cav Pag, which stands for Cavalleria Rusticana and I Pagliacci. I Pagliacci is an opera that features Commedia dell'arte, which you may have seen me talk about in one or more videos here on the channel. Cav Pag consists of two one-hour operas that are often built together as one package. One opera, intermission, the other opera. So these two composers are nothing to scoff at, but for whatever reason, Puccini really became opera's darling, and many and most of his operas are regularly programmed to this day. Puccini was exceptionally good at telling story through music, influenced by Wagner, and enabling emotionally complex and detailed narratives to flow freely through his use of melody. The music intertwined with characters so well that it was inevitable that folks would become attached to those characters and their experiences. Puccini operas relied heavily on themes of love, sacrifice, passion, and tragedy, which allowed them to stand the test of time, because after all, those themes are all still relevant, even a century after Puccini's death. Speaking of Puccini's death, Turandot was in fact Puccini's final opera. And by final opera, I mean he didn't finish it, he died. Turandot is an opera in three acts by Giacomo Puccini, left unfinished in 1924. It was subsequently finished by Franco Alfano, Luciano Berrio, Hao Wei Ya, and most recently, Civilization 4 and 5 composer Christopher Tin. Turandot is set in ancient China and tells the story of Princess Turandot, who challenges her potential partners to solve three riddles. If they can't, well, death and execution. Prince Kalaf shows up and says, uh-uh, her, I want her. He somehow answers all three of her riddles right, to the dismay of Turandot, but Kalaf gives her an out. If she can somehow learn his name by dawn, he'll let himself be executed. Why? Because opera, that, that makes no sense to me, but, but okay. And of course, despite her icy heart, Kalaf is able to slowly warm it, and Turandot and Kalaf live happily ever after, I guess. So when Esun Dorma, No One Sleeps, appears in the opera, we're at a peak of dramatic tension. 
No one sleeps that night as everyone tries to find out the name of Kalaf so they can let Turandot know. She must know his name. I find it kind of interesting that the constellation in English is, My secret is hidden within me. No one will know my name. This repurposed use of the lyrics to represent the secret that Farina hides throughout our time with her in Fontaine is certainly the point here, but it's such a different context. It's fun, makes me smile as a person who really knows this aria. How cool to take Ma il mio mistero è chiuso in me, il nome mio nessun saprà no no, and turn it into lyrics that relate to a character in a video game 100 years later. I don't think that that even cheapens the aria in the slightest. If anything, I think it enhances it, makes it more interesting, and I love the fact that 100 years later, here we are, still talking about this opera. However, before we finish up with Turandot, we have to highlight the fifth constellation for Farina. His name, I now know, it is dot dot dot, love. His name is love. In the end, Turandot allows Kalaf to love her the way he knows he can. She submits to his advances, allowing him into her life, and like I said, I, I guess they'll be happily ever after, or something. Seems, seems a little intense to me personally, but Orpheus in the Underworld. No one is going to deny how old the story of Orpheus in the Underworld is, nor is anyone going to deny the fascination with this particular story. I mean, shoot, we've even seen it as recently as in 2018 in Hades. This tragic tale of Orpheus's love goes something like this for the uninitiated. Orpheus was a musician known for his skill with a lyre. Eurydice gets bitten by a snake and dies. He refuses to leave her in the underworld and goes down to get her. His music and skill with the lyre convince Hades and Persephone to allow Eurydice to return to the land of the living with one stipulation. Orpheus cannot look back at her until they've arrived in the upper world. Orpheus is racked with guilt and desire for not being able to look back at her. Please look at me, Orpheus, please, and wanting to reassure her. So he does. Just like that, she's whisked away back to the land of the dead. Pretty depressing, I'd say. Jacques Offenbach, 19th century German-born French composer, wasn't into that depressing <laughs> though, and decided, you know what? Let me turn this into a humorous, lighthearted affair. What could be funnier than losing your loved one and getting a chance to get them back, but royally f***ing <laughs> it up? <laughs> Offenbach's operettas. Operetta, by the way, is basically the middleman between opera and musical theater. There's spoken dialogue, ensembles, songs, and choruses, but typically it's all based on light and humorous plot lines with comedy or romance, not to mention pretty simple, playful plots with satire thrown into the mix. Definitions. People love them. It's funny because in the operetta by Offenbach, there are a few notable and funny differences to the tragic Greek myth. Orpheus really only cares about his music and is a bit bored. Eurydice isn't really all that in love with Orpheus and is kind of excited at the chance to experience something new in the underworld. The underworld itself is described as chaotic and kind of a spot for a giant party rather than hell. And there's a ton of music and dance, like the Can Can, which is probably the most famous piece from this operetta. You've heard it like anytime you've thought of the Belle Epoque, anytime you've thought of Moulin Rouge, you know, the thing with the Can Can girls. Ba, ba, ra, ba, 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 hey, hey, hey. Orpheus in the Underworld and this playful nature to it is not actually dissimilar to Fontaine's comparisons to Nouvellet and Farina. Nouvellet is serious, tragic, the Greek myth while Farina's playful, silly, grand entrances and showmanship, lots of flaunting, playfulness, and a lack of respect for the serious matters at hand, well, until, of course, it's too late. In fact, the line of the constellation is, they know not life, those who dwell in the underworld not. The underworld is presented in the operetta as a place that is fun, not like the world above with its boring and apathetic aspects. The point here is irony. Despite folks in the underworld thinking that life is fun and exciting, they don't actually get to experience the true beauty even in the mundane of life because they're in the underworld. I'm actually kind of impressed that they were able to find a random quote from Orpheus in the Underworld because it's not A, that popular, and B, they could have pulled from a million other direct quotes when writing these constellations. So the fact that they were able to find this random quote from Orpheus in the Underworld shows the amount of level of care and attention to detail that went into finding constellations that would somehow connect directly to Farina in one way or another. La Traviata. Back to Giuseppe Verdi or Joe Green to you. La Traviata is another one of Verdi's arguably most famous works, if not the most famous. Remember that Verdi wrote Rigoletto at the height of his fame in 1851. Traviata premiered in 18. 1853. Interestingly, Traviata wasn't quite a major success, actually, and faced a bit of a mixed reaction. Essentially, critics weren't into the idea of a main lead who lived a double life between opulent class and, well, prostitution. After all, Violetta was a courtesan. Ever seen Pretty Woman? That's a bit of a modern retelling of the story of La Traviata. The opera actually had major emotional depth, and slowly over time, people began to warm to it. So much so that now Traviata is one of the most beloved and frequently performed operas in the world. Definitely a masterpiece if you ever want to check it out. The plot centers around Violetta Valeri, the uh, 
courtesan I mentioned earlier and the guy totally obsessed with her, Alfredo Germont, a young and wealthy middle class man. Alfredo confesses his love to Violetta in Act 1, and despite being sort of against love, Violetta starts to think, shoot, maybe I could deserve something good like this guy who would adore me. Nah, wait, maybe? I don't know. Okay, why not? They run away together and live in the countryside when Alfredo's dad shows up when Alfredo goes out of town and tells Violetta that she needs to break up with him because Alfredo being with her looks super bad for the family. His daughter can't even get married with Violetta in the picture. Violetta says she'll do it for love for Alfredo and his family and leaves secretly. Alfredo finds out that she left, though of course his dad leaves out the reason why him. Alfredo swears that he'll get payback and love hurts. <laughs> a few months later, he goes to a party he knows Violetta will be at and throws a bunch of money at her and basically calls her a bunch of names publicly and is chastised by everyone, including his dad who's randomly there and he's like, how can you treat a woman this way even though I secretly told her to leave you? Oops, my bad. Anyway, we end the opera with Violetta dying of consumption, tuberculosis which she had since the start, oops, surprise, and Alfredo and his father join her right before she passes, so she is absolved, and everyone lives happily ever after, except not really, because Alfredo and his dad are racked with guilt and wish things could have been different, uh, too late, too bad. It is an immensely powerful final act, and truly one of the most somber in all of opera. The constellation name here, though, is Hear Me, Let Us Raise the Chalice of Love. This quote is actually from the happiest part of the opera, when Violetta and Alfredo sing the famous Libiamo chorus and duet, you know it, Libiamo! Another piece of opera music magic that you've heard literally like in a bajillion commercials and galas or concerts or whatever. This piece is the quintessential Verdi. And it's such a blast. Let's drink to love and to life. It's a fun moment where everyone is just having a good time before life unsurprisingly gets in the way. I think again, this constellation and the final constellation for Farina is a reminder that Farina is about having a good time. She wants her followers to feel optimistic, positive, lively, and enjoy life. That is ultimately what she's all about. Playfulness, joy, and love. And who wouldn't want anything more than to toast and celebrate life and love? <sighs> we did it. Holy crap, opera is alive, baby. I'm grateful for games like Genshin that don't make opera a pastiche or something that's really dumb or make fun of it. Opera's been around for hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds actually and is super meaningful. If you ever get the chance, check out a local performance of one of these operas and see if you can spot the lines from these constellations in them. And if you can't go somewhere local, YouTube is a goldmine for you. There are so many operas on here that you can find with subtitles in your spoken language. It might be boring at first, trust me, even I've fallen asleep at opera. But if you go in with an open mind, you might just be shocked at the possibilities you'll find when you come out the other end. You might fall madly in love with a new art form. And that's really exciting. Feel free to like and subscribe. Check out the links in the about section if you want to support the channel. And as always, I'll talk to you later. Bye.